All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar on local strategies to reduce methane emissions from solid waste and benefit communities. My name is Ellie Garland, and I am a senior associate with RMI, a nonprofit organization working to advance the clean energy transition and cut methane. Over the course of today's webinar, RMI will provide a brief overview of waste sector methane and key strategies to reduce emissions while benefiting communities. We'll have four local leaders discuss initiatives in their communities to reduce waste sector methane, sharing uh, lessons learned. And US EPA will join us to discuss technical resources and federal funding opportunities that can support further efforts to advance sustainable waste management at the local level. We will leave time for questions and answers with all panelists at the end. And you can submit questions at any time during the webinar by entering them into the Zoom Q&A function. We will also be recording today's discussion and we'll share the slides, resources, and the recording uh, with all attendees after the event. And with that, I will hand it off to my colleague, Tom Frankowitz, um, a principal with RMI, who will introduce a special guest for some opening remarks. Tom? Thank you, Ellie. Hi, I'm Tom Franquis. I'm a waste sector methane subject matter expert with RMI, and it's my pleasure to introduce Gina McCarthy. As the first White House National Climate Advisor and former US EPA Administrator, Gina McCarthy is one of the country's most respected voices on climate change, the environment, and public health. Her leadership has led to the most ambitious action on climate in US history, with new job creation and unprecedented clean energy innovation and investments across the country. Gina's commitment to bold action across the federal government, along with the help of historic legislation, like the Inflation Reduction Act, has restored US climate leadership on a global stage and put our climate targets back within reach. Gina McCarthy is also now the managing co-chair of the America is All In Coalition. Gina, welcome. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and welcome everybody. I'm so excited to do some trash talking with you today. Look, I'm talking about the major opportunities we have today to cut methane, the supercharged climate polluter that's emitted from buried solid waste and the essential role that all of you play at the local level to drive real on the ground solutions. Look, I know when we think of methane, we often picture leaking pipelines or belching cows, but I'm here to remind you that our trash is the third largest source of human-caused methane pollution in the United States. And that's a big deal. Organic waste like banana peels and pizza boxes and yard clipping buried in landfills, all of that release methane, and that's a short-lived climate pollutant that has 80 times the heating power of carbon dioxide. And now, thanks to major advances in aircraft and satellite technology, we can even see the methane that's leaking at our landfills, right up from to the sky and even into space. A major paper that was just published in Science found high emitting methane plumes at hundreds of landfills across the country. And let's not forget that on top of methane, landfill emits odors, hazardous air pollutions, and smog forming compounds that impact the health and well being of nearby communities, many of which are disproportionately low income or communities of color. But the good news is, there are clear solutions that we can put in place today for people in the planet. That's what we wanna talk about. Local governments, all of you on this call, play a critical role as implementers of action, which is why I'm excited to have joined to learn about all the different ways that we can all make change happen. First, Reducing, reducing methane from landfills starts with prevention. That means keeping organic waste out of landfills. That means food recovery as well as composting programs. 
These are the most effective steps that you can take to avoid future methane generation in landfills while putting organic material to its highest and best use. And for waste already in landfills, there are simple low cost ways to avoid methane leaks, early and expanded gas collection, better landfill covers, and more methane monitoring more often. You know, when it comes to waste management, local governments have broad authority, which means methane reduction strategies are firmly within your reach. In fact, today you'll be hearing from local leaders across our country who are already implementing solutions and will be sharing some of the latest tools and funding opportunities now available to help all of your communities take action. Cutting methane is the strongest lever that we have to slow the rate of near-term warming and to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Many of you are likely already feeling the impact of climate across your communities, but a more sustainable waste management system that stops methane leaks can provide real local benefits. Because when you control methane, you also stop emissions of harmful co-pollutants. Co you improve local air quality. You create job opportunities in the circular economy that helps put people back to work. You boost soil health through composting, which opens up real opportunities for growing nutritious food that all of our families need. And you can alleviate hunger through food, food donation. That's why we always talk about actions like stopping methane leaks as benefits to people as well as the planet. Because when you stop methane, you immediately improve the health and well being of people in your community. And we all know that's what success looks like. So I hope you folks hear today. Lots of information that's going to inform and inspire and excite you so we can gather more and more success stories to share with others because success breeds success. And frankly, we have no time to waste. Thanks so much. Now back to Tom. Thank you, Gina. That's a great, uh, great overview and, and I think gives some great context to uh, why we're all here today. Just to provide a little bit more background before we hear from, from local leaders on the ground, I want to talk a little bit about the significance of methane and climate change. Next. Each year, we, spend, we send more than 140 million tons of municipal solid waste to roughly 1,200 open landfills across the U.S. The majority of the waste is organic, including things, uh, or biode biodegradable content, including things like food waste, uh, paper, cardboard, uh, anything that'll break down naturally. At the landfill, our waste is buried in layers or cells, uh, or as the New York Times has recently put it, in uh, a garbage lasagna. As the organic fraction decomposes anaerobically or without oxygen, it generates methane gas. Most modern landfills are designed to capture their gas through a system of pipes, wellheads, blowers, working in tandem with the landfill cover. <clears throat> collected gas is then flared, emitting less, uh, less potent carbon dioxide or put to beneficial use through an electricity or biomethane project, for example. But even landfills with gas collection systems do not capture all of the methane. All told, municipal landfills are the third largest source of methane in the U.S., emitting an estimated 3.6 million tons of methane in 2022 alone, according to the U.S. EPA annual inventory and likely more as recent aerial surveys have shown. I'd like to underscore why methane matters when we're thinking about climate action. Due to its relatively short lifespan and outsized global warming potential, roughly 80 times that of carbon dioxide on a 20 year time frame, tackling methane is the strongest lever we have to slow climate change in the near term, which is critical to buying us more time as Gina suggested. And when it comes to opportunities at the local level, the waste sector is prime for action. It comes under the local jurisdiction of municipalities, and it's one of the clearest, most affordable ways to achieve climate and community benefits at the same time. Next. Solutions. The solutions here are, are clear. We must keep organic waste out of landfills to avoid future methane 
from being emitted in the first place. But at the same time, we have to improve landfill gas control for the waste already buried that would otherwise continue emitting methane for decades. To maximize climate benefits, we must do both simultaneously. Next, prevention. When it comes to waste prevention and diversion, EPA's recently published Wasted Food Scale is a great guide. After all, food waste is the single most common material sent to landfills. First, we must prioritize source reduction, doing everything we can to prevent waste from being generated in the first place. Second, we must donate or upcycle surplus edible food. And then finally, we need to recycle any organic waste that remains, transforming it into things like animal feed, nutrient-rich compost, or to biogas in a digester with fully monitoring and capturing all of the methane. Next. Mitigation strategies. When it comes to controlling methane at the landfill, simple changes can go a long way. We can do things like installing gas collection systems earlier and across the full scope of the landfill, boost gas collection through better systems management, improve cover materials and practices to better manage surface methane or area source emissions, and expand leak detection and repair, including using new technologies like drones, satellites, continuous sensors, to find and fix le leaks quickly. Next, local benefits. Local governments have broad authority over waste management to make a big difference whether there is a landfill in the community or not. We're going to hear some great examples of community action, including educational campaigns to reduce household waste, partnerships to expand food recovery and circularity, investing in community composting and curbside organics collection programs, and best practices at landfills to maximize methane capture at final disposal. Next. And beyond the climate benefits, benefits, tackling waste methane is good for communities in many other ways, including impact on air quality, public health, local food systems, soil health, job creation, economic development, and the list goes on. Lastly, I want to talk about some, R some resources developed at RMI. I'd like to quickly highlight the Waste Methane Assessment Platform, a platform RMI developed in cooperation with Cleaner Task Force with generous support from the Global Methane Hub. It helps track emissions from the waste sector, and it also includes helpful resources, including a decision support tool to help local governments model different scenarios that they could deploy to reduce methane and improve waste management, and a US playbook focused on how advanced monitoring technologies can help municipalities today to help curb methane. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tom. <clears throat> and next slide, please. So now I'll take a moment to introduce the folks on our local government solutions panel. Uh, we have brought together practitioners from across the country to showcase some of the great work already being done to address methane at the local level, uh, from waste prevention and community composting to advanced landfill gas controls. Uh, first, we will hear from Ari Alex, the Sustainability Manager for the City of Columbus, Ohio, and the Executive Director of Keep Columbus Beautiful. Then we'll hear from Michael Martinez, the Founder and Executive Director of LA Compost, a community-based organization that provides composting access and education with a network of compost hubs throughout the County of Los Angeles. After Michael, we will be joined by Roxanne Winkus, the Deputy Director of the Department of Waste and Renewables in Dane County, Wisconsin. And then to wrap up our local presentations, we will hear from Tom Kutrulis, the Director of Waste and Recycling for Orange County in California. Um, and with that, I will hand it to Ari to kick us off. Thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm Ari Alex. I'm the Sustainability Manager for the City of Columbus, Ohio in our Department of Public Service. And um, I am here to talk a little bit about what we're doing on, on our food waste reduction work. So the City of Columbus, for some background, is about a million people. We're here in Ohio, we're the state capital, uh, and we are rapidly growing. We're expected to have another million people uh, move into the region in the next 20 years. If we can go to the next slide. Um, 
Our mayor announced the Columbus Climate Action Plan in 2021, where we have an ambitious goal of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 and 100% to be carbon neutral by 2050. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, thank you. And, th and the next one after that. So when we did a greenhouse gas inventory, uh, 5%, a little over 5% actually came from our solid waste sector. So the largest part comes from uh, our industrial and commercial and primarily transportation sectors. But we also look at that waste sector as being one of the easiest things that we can quickly resolve as we work on large scale policy to resolve and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from the other sector. To go to the next slide, um, specifically, on the organic waste side, we are looking at a 50% reduction by 2030 and a 90% reduction by 2050. We anticipate this about being about 133,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions saved. And tied with that, we set a circular economy goal uh, of growing jobs in this space because we know it's not just enough to reduce that waste going to the landfill, but how do we create jobs in that sector to make it a sustainable and economically viable um, footprint. So if we go to the next slide, um, we did a residential waste audit and the we, we found we have about 74,000 tons of compostable material going to the landfill every year. Um, that is about 23% of our residential sector. Uh, and when we look at here, yard waste is included. Uh, we have free residential yard waste collection already. So we are already collecting and diverting yard waste, yet we still have 18,000 tons that are going into the trash bins and are going to the landfill. And what we also have here is that we have edible food, both packaged and non-packaged in the residential stream. And this is food that we actually want to make sure we are rescuing first um, so that we can feed those that are food insecure. When we look at all of the food going to the landfill, and we have a, a municipal or a government run landfill here in central Ohio, and so from all the municipalities, both commercial and um, residential, we're throwing away about a million pounds of food a day as a region. Uh, and that is far too much. And this is a region where it costs just under $40 a ton to throw away. So it's really cheap to throw things away. But it's such a priority for our city to lead in this space that we have made reduction uh, through composting a really poor program. If we go to the next slide, um, when we set the goal, it was a very ambitious goal. We didn't know necessarily how we were going to get there. We were really proud to partner with the Natural Resources Defense Council's Food Matters program, which paired us with many other cities throughout the country to kind of learn some best practices and create a space where we can share uh, information. Uh, through that, NRDC actually uh, helped uh, fund some waste reduction, food waste reduction grants in our city, which gave us some real capacity assessment to kind of see what work needed to be done. Uh, from that, if we go to the next slide, uh, Columbus Mayor Andrew J. Ginther moved to sign on the city of Columbus to the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. This not only gave us expertise throughout America, but learning from other countries around the world and further solidified our work to reduce food waste here. So with those policies in place, we started figuring out what are we going to do? Uh, we started with some pilot programs. If we go to the next slide, in our municipal city buildings, uh, we set up some vermicomposting uh, units. And so these are for city employees, these are internal, but it allowed us to test education models, to kind of gain feedback from our employees here, to see participation and contamination rates. It really gave us a good kind of bit of information for us to weigh into something. From that, we went public. And if we go to the next slide, we launched our food scraps drop-off program. And this was uh, late last year. We opened three free drop-off sites for residents. And a really interesting thing here is we uh, intentionally called it food scraps versus food waste. When talking with residents and community leaders, particularly in low income communities and communities of color, we were told there is no wasted food. And, but there are scraps that we can't eat and we won't use. And so we intentionally made the shift to, from calling this our food waste work to our food scraps work. And so here's our mayor announcing those first three programs. Um, 
when we opened those three sites, it wasn't enough just to say, okay, here they are, here's a press release. We launched an intensive education campaign to residents with this. And if we go to the next slide, we did uh, three flights of mail um, to residents within a mile radius of those sites. One of those was kind of announcing the site. One of those was saying how we can reduce food and save money. Something like if you're going to eat five bananas, don't buy seven bananas. Uh, how do you eat your leftovers? Uh, how to use those leftovers into other things. So those three mail pieces hit over a three month window. We also layered that with digital ads uh, so and billboards so that residents were getting a ton of information related to that. We go to the next slide. Uh, in the first uh, couple of months of this, we've already collected 50,000 pounds of food just from three sites. Um, and we think that that is really, really successful. And if we go to the next slide, um, we are expanding those to nine locations by the end of 2024. Those are already cited and permitted. We are being very intentional about where we are placing those. We are placing those in new American communities. We have the second largest Somali population. So we are making sure that we are in those communities and in low income communities that have been traditionally redlined so that we can offer this service free to those residents first. This is kind of our first step into this. At some point we'll need to uh, kind of expand to some curbside collection of some sort, but this is our first foray. And then the last piece of this on the next slide that we'll hit is that we're also looking at our, our wastewater capacity. We currently have 100% beneficial reuse of our biosolids uh, through a composting project, but we're building new capacity through anaerobic digestion here, which will have capacity to accept additional organic material. So as we ramp up collection and education efforts to divert that material, we'll have both our compost that we currently have, but we'll also have added capacity on the anaerobic digestion side, which will be able to produce a lot uh, additional capacity, not only for the city, but for the region and particularly the commercial sector of things. So last slide, um, here's my contact information and it's so great uh, to be part of this uh, conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ari. Great to hear all the work that's uh, going on in Columbus. And now I will hand it to Michael with LA Compost. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Martinez, founder and executive director of LA Compost. You can go to the next slide. Um, although I am not a government agency, I am uh, representing a local nonprofit of 10 years that is very much in partnership with our governments here in Los Angeles. Um, really brief commercial snapshot as to who we are. Uh, we've been doing this work for two years and we really focus on connections, connections with the communities that we work with, uh, connections with the soil and the soil biology, and really embodying and mimicking the connections that are taking place actually in healthy soil. We very much talk about this mycorrhizal kingdom, these connections below the ground that allow trees and plants to communicate. And what we're trying to do at LA Compost is establish a robust, fully alive human network that allows folks to know the full story of food. Uh, what started off as picking up food scraps on bike uh, and taking it to backyards to compost is now a really robust decentralized network of community compost hubs all across the most populated county in the country. We have over 50 locations, and these are locations in schools, churches, museums, community gardens, parks, urban farms, anywhere really where there is food and the ability to tell that full story of food. We are intentional to hire folks within the community because what better individual to know about their community than someone who was born and raised and seen development over time to really facilitate the uh, compost offerings that take place. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a, a brief snapshot of our network at different scales. We kind of operate under different buckets uh, in partnership with the city. We offer farmer's market food scrap drop-off locations. We offer our cooperative hub model where individuals can, similar to what um, Columbus is doing, drop off at various green space locations. And then we have our regional approach, which is located in parks or urban farms that are processing a higher volume of material. And that material is returned back to those parks as well as given away to the general public uh, for free throughout the year. Could go to the next slide. Um, we've kind of started with this co-op hub model of building infrastructure in existing spaces. These are museums, these are housing projects, these are any green spaces where we could come alongside and tell that full story of food, not just where food is, is grown or how it's labeled, but really engage in the conversation of after the table experience and ensure it truly is closed loop. 
Um, as a former elementary school teacher, I truly believe education is only as strong as the ability to put what was learned into practice. So we wanted to ensure that our educational offerings allowed for folks to make mistakes, to learn alongside their neighbors, and to know that they can return to a consistent location to receive feedback and ongoing support. Can go to the next slide. Um, our farmer's market uh, food scrap program was similar to what many other states across the country have been doing. This is our fastest growing program to date where we are partnering with different farmer's markets across the city and county of Los Angeles to allow for individuals to freeze their food scraps throughout the week, drop it off at the farmer's market prior to shopping for their fruits and vegetables for that week. And then it's processed and composted within a five mile radius of that market at one of our hubs. Uh, this has just been a really great user experience for folks to volunteer behind the table, eventually go to the location where we're processing and actually just put a human to a human face to composting. We recognize that composting oftentimes is advertised to be like backyard in the shadows, kind of like hidden away. We want to put it front and center and make sure that there's a level of investment and appreciation and ownership by seeing it everywhere. Where do we place hubs and compost opportunities where folks are naturally doing life? And with some of the farmers markets in LA where we have thousands of individuals visiting weekly, it's just a nice opportunity to spotlight this work. Next slide. Um, similar to our community hubs, we offer regional hubs, which are hand-turned windrow piles where we're processing thousands of pounds a week to really allow folks to see that snapshot, to see it go from scraps to high temp decomposition to curing, maturing, sifted compost that can be returned back to their garden. It's a great opportunity for folks to collaboratively work together, be outside, People have been volunteering with us consistently for years because it's like their gym membership of showing up, turning the piles, and just getting to learn more about that space. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, the heart of what we do and what glues it all together is our educational offerings. Sure, we teach Compost 101. Sure, we teach how to start a, a pile. But what we're starting to look at is really the effects and impacts of composting, but also starting to get into soil biology. We offer free community soil sessions we're launching free community soil-based labs that allow for folks to look at their soil and compost under the microscope. And this fall, we're launching our first ever um, electric magic soil bus that is gonna actually be traveling to Title I LUSD schools in a mobile field trip manner to talk to kids about the power of compost, soil health, and how they can get involved. Next slide. In 2019, the city of LA launched their Green New Deal plan. And what was nice is our work for the past several years was not just a hobby or a pilot, but starting to become legitimate. And we were really excited to be included in the city's Green New Deal plan, which kind of had some verbatim goals um, from our own strategic plan. So there, there's ambitious goals to be at every farmer's market. There's ambitious goals to create community or regional hub master plans, and also to eliminate organic uh, scraps from landfill completely by 2028, uh, being a little bit more ambitious than what our state mandate SB 1383 is for the state of California. Next slide. Um, I think what's been really important is to really partner with the city of Los Angeles. I think being on city's websites, being on mailers, being on their webinars is, is a nice sign of legitimacy. And we've worked really closely with LA Sanitation who has been doing a great job to implement SB 1383, which is the curbside organics collection and their organics LA program. We've been really, um, filling in this specific puzzle piece of community engagement and community offerings and really shining light on the many options that folks in Los Angeles have to compost from the backyard and food recovery efforts to the community compost options to the curbside options. Next slide. In addition to city, we've also been working with the state of California. CalRecycle has put out two community composting for green spaces programs, which we've been involved with both. This second round, we are actually the facilitator for the greater LA region which we are supporting over 80 community composting locations from Ventura, Santa Barbara, LA, and Orange County, and really coaching and providing that technical assistance uh, to groups who are getting started, who have been doing this, to take it to that next level. Next slide. Um, City of Los Angeles, in partnership with LA Compost, recently secured the second round of USDA grant funding uh, to continue these food recovery efforts and community composting efforts, and really showcasing how um, a city as large as Los Angeles can still focus on the community-based efforts that are so important um, as this work moves forward. Next slide. Our tagline is soil and people. And I think the beauty of a compost pile really comes from its diverse ingredients, the fact that it invites everything to be a part of this really beautiful process. And 
for us at LA Compass, a, a huge focus of our energy is on our communities, is on the people. We are community composters and we focus on both of those words equally. I myself grew up next to one of the largest landfills in the country. The Puente Hills landfill was my backyard. So I am no stranger to landfills and garbage trucks going through neighborhoods. And now what a beautiful poetic justice, like time to be alive in that. Now I am part of the conversations of that landfill, now gonna turn into a regional park with potential community compost offerings. So it's it's been really incredible to be a part of this kind of narrative and journey. And I'm really excited to hear how local governments are putting a lot of attention and energy onto the individual offerings because it starts with um, with all of us. We are the constituents of these goals. So next slide is just my information. Um, if you want to get in contact with us, um, again, my name is Michael Martinez and I'm very much happy and privileged to hold space with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was great to hear about. Um, and now I will turn it over to Roxanne with Dane County. Hi, thanks Ellie. Uh, and thanks RMI for the invitation for being here today. Um, you can go to the next slide. I'm Roxanne Winkus with Dane County's Department of Waste and Renewables. Uh, Dane County is in South Central Wisconsin and we host our capital city of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, the Department of Waste and Renewables operates our active landfill, uh, the only one in Dane County. Uh, we also have a household hazardous waste collection facility a construction and demolition recycling facility. And we own and operate a renewable natural gas plant where we upgrade our landfill gas to pipeline quality uh, natural gas and we sell it for vehicle fuel. A few stats on the page, we manage about 3, 300,000 tons of waste each year. We process 70,000 tons of material, uh, construction and demolition material for recycling. And in 2023, we produced the equivalent of 3 million gallons of gasoline uh, and renewable natural gas. We also have a very active education and outreach program. And each year we reach about 3,000 community members on site and out at community events with our mobile um, trash exhibit. Next slide, please. Uh, we're really fortunate to be part of a larger organization, the County of Dane, uh, that sets a priority for um, you know, carbon emission reduction. And much like the other speakers, um, that you know, our, our um, county has set a goal to be, um, you know, reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, and then be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, we're well on track to reaching that 2030 goal. Um, but a caveat to that is it doesn't include the landfill's fugitive emissions. It, inc it includes the emissions that are attributed to our county's operations waste, but we're trying to assess with our 2050 goal if we can include the fugitive emissions of the landfill and all of Dane County's waste and really try to make our landfill net zero by 2050. Um, next slide, please. To achieve this, we have hired a full-time carbon program manager, carbon emissions program manager, and that person's goal and directive is to strategize on how the landfill gets to net zero. So the pie chart on the slide is our current assessment of our operations, our department's operations, where our emissions are coming from. And you can see clearly the biggest piece of that pie is from landfill fugitive emissions. Next being our energy consumption, sorry. And then uh, also the combustion of the landfill gas and the tail gas from our RNG plant. So our strategy is to focus on the biggest piece of that pie first. How are we going to chip away at the landfill fugitive emissions? Um, we've got a number of strategies in place for that, but really it comes down to what our uh, keynote said, being diligent about how we manage the landfill, how we collect gas, a good cover, and really the basics. Um, we're also gonna look into additional waste diversion measures. Um, and we want to um, prevent emissions from being generated in the first place. But from what we can do uh, as, an organ or as an organization, as the landfill operation, is to really seal up that landfill and try to prevent those fugitive emissions. Go to the next slide. So what are those basics? So um, we've found time and time again that good training for our staff and investment in additional staff for managing our well field is super important. 
Um, we've hired an additional staff here just in the last few weeks to help us out with that. There's a ton of maintenance that is required in a well field. Um, what you're looking at on the screen is one of, a, one of the landfill gas extraction wells on our site. That's a vertical pipe that goes into the waste and we're putting vacuum on that well and pulling that gas to our renewable natural gas plant. Um, a landfill is not an entirely closed system. So we have to make sure that all of our penetrations are sealed up really good and that we're able to get good vacuum on that hill and pull as much gas as possible without introducing air into the landfill. We found that uh, installation of horizontal gas extraction wells in our active area are key to making sure that we're capturing all of that gas in the active area of the landfill. It's difficult to install those vertical wells because um, you generally wait until you've reached the final elevation of the landfill um, to then drill that well so you don't have to continue to extend it. Um, so a good robust plan for installing horizontal wells is very important to controlling emissions in our landfill early. We have a number of motivations for why we wanna capture that gas and it, it's not just to um, prevent emissions. Um, so our gas is, is really valuable, um, you know, as a result of um, programs that are in place for um, renewable credits for our vehicle fuel that we sell. So we want to capture as much of that gas as possible. And time and time again, it comes back to this, good monitoring, good maintenance in the well field, and good collection systems being installed. Uh, next slide, please. However, um, we have found we it is so important to us because our gas is so valuable to us. Um, we have invested uh, additional uh, resources to technology. So we have installed automated um, landfill gas wells at about half of our wells have this system installed on them. Traditionally, um, as you saw in the previous picture, you go around and you monitor each well. It's required to do it monthly, but most landfills do it much more frequently than that, whether it's weekly or daily. But still, you, there's a lot that can happen from day to day in a landfill. Uh, because it's not a sealed system, the barometric pressure really impacts how hard you're able to extract the gas from the, from the well field. And so this system that's uh, has sampling equipment installed at a number of the wells on the landfill. It's taking a landfill gas reading about every 15 minutes, and it's telling a valve, an automated valve, either to open or close, to pull harder or less hard on that particular area of the well so that we can maximize the gas extraction in that um, location without overpulling and then pulling atmospheric air into the, into the waste, which can slow the microbial activity and prevent the um, the formation of methane, but it can also cause fires. So we need to, it's a very fine balance of how hard we can pull in the landfill. And this system allows us to achieve that on a much more frequent basis than going around and doing the collect, doing the readings manually. Um, the other benefit of this system is you can set a target gas flow and qual quality. And what that does is it allows us to feed our RNG plant. It's a $30 million system. It's highly um, technical, highly technical and highly automated in its own right, but it operates best on a very steady and consistent stream of landfill gas quality. So that's another uh, benefit of this system that, um, that we found. And then, by, and then lastly, on, on the automated and the data collection, it's a, it's a ton of data. And if you have data, you can just more quickly assess, you know, issues in your well field improvements, where you can pull or where you can, where you can make improvements. And, and that data is proved time and time again to be invaluable when we're troubleshooting and trying to plan out here. Next slide, please. Some additional technology we're considering in our landfill gas plant is um, a carbon capture, uh, a carbon capture system. So the main priority of the RNG plant right now is to pull that methane fraction out of the landfill gas. Landfill gas is about 50% methane, about 30% carbon dioxide, and then some other trace gases that in either are a result of you know, contamination or um, a result of atmospheric air intrusion. So in one part of the process in our plan, we have nearly a, uh, you know, a pretty pure stream of CO2. What we're doing right now is we're assessing the feasibility of being able to extract that CO2 from the process and further refine it, 
We've looked at geological sequestration as an option. However, we're, it, our region isn't great for it. We don't really have that option. So we're considering um, upgrading it for beneficial reuse instead. Um, and we think the dollars and cents works out. Uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned is that we are we operate like a business. So we are a municipal organization, but all of our tipping fees and all of our revenue from our gas have to offset one another. Um, so we have to make a decision based on the you know potential for revenue for that product is if it's going to if it's going to work out for itself and and we think it's pretty close so the co2 could be used for dry ice ice manufacturing or it could be used for beverage grade and it doesn't you know sequester it indefinitely underground however at least it offsets conventional co2 next slide so some of the other things that we do already at the site uh, is we have uh, various recycling programs. And this one prevents organic material from getting into the waste stream. But we have a C&D recycling facility, construction demolition recycling facility, where we process wood, metal, shingles, tires, uh, vinyl siding, cardboard, aggregate. And those organic materials that we're pulling out, if they don't make it into the landfill, we're preventing those emissions. But the other thing that's happening is those materials that we're putting back into the circular economy are offsetting you know, those raw uh, products. So we found that in our carbon accounting, programs like this are really gonna help us make the way, make, it, make our way to net zero. Next slide, please. We're pretty, we're pretty busy at the Department of Waste and Renewables. Our existing landfill is going to reach its capacity in 2029. And in landfill years, that's not a lot of years. Um, so we've been actively working to permit a new landfill across the road from our existing site. Um, but we don't want it to be just another landfill. We are dedicating 30 acres of that property. And anybody who operates a solid waste facility knows how important and how valuable your land is because land is landfill and airspace. But we're trying to take a different approach where we're going to carve out 30 acres of that property and we are going to um, try to build a sustainable business park. We're issuing RFIs this fall. Um, there are many other examples within the United States of folks who have done this. We've got Kent County, Michigan. There's been efforts in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, uh, we're going to try to attract waste processors and see what we can do to further divert waste from our waste stream. Next slide, please. And much like many of the other speakers, the first step in that process is food waste. We know that this makes, we know that or, the organic fraction of our waste in our landfill is about 30% of the material that goes into the landfill. So much like that pie chart that showed emissions, we have a similar pie chart that shows the type of waste that goes into the landfill. And what we're focusing on is that, those big fractions and how can we make the biggest dent in our waste stream? And it's organics. So um, we also received um, the USDA grant for um, um, food waste reduction uh, this year. So we will be implementing food waste kiosks and I will be calling all the folks on this call who've already done it so successfully. So we're rolling them out here. Uh, this, uh, this, we'll start planning this fall and roll them out next uh, summer. I think that's it, Ellie. Perfect, thank you so much, Roxanne, that was great. Um, and now I will hand it over to our last uh, presenter in this section, Tom uh, Katrulis with Orange County. All right. Well, good morning. Or it's good morning for me. Good afternoon for, for some of you. I'm Tom Katrulis. I said, go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, I am the director for OC Waste and Recycling here in Southern California. Uh, and I, I can say I've been in this role now for about six and a half years. And it's been a journey uh, for us and our team as we change what we're doing as a government agency and serving, uh, providing an essential public service. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So a little bit about us. Um, we we um, serve the 34 cities that comprise of about 3.2 million residents in the County of Orange. Uh, the agency uh, was formed back in the early 40s. We have closed lands, landfills uh, that we manage. Uh, we have three very large active landfills and we receive uh, roughly about um, at those landfills, about over 5 million tons annually of waste um, coming into the system. And so, um, you know, we are, uh, again, it was mentioned earlier about SB 1383, and this is a, um, a bill that was passed regarding uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases for short-lived climate pollutant 
pollutants reduction and edible food recovery. So this has been, I'll say, uh, legislation that's been shifting, uh, I'll say, every jurisdiction's focus on organic diversion and resource recovery. And as an agency that serves the public, uh, our, our history has been strictly focused on uh, landfilling and a very rich history and culture around it. And so uh, we started changing the way we looked at our our what we do and provide as an essential public service to see how we can step in the gap and came up with uh, the concept of co-locating uh, compost facilities at our landfills and change really changing our business model to resource recovery. And um, right, we do have landfill gas for renewable energy uh, and we're looking at and working towards landfill gas for renewable natural gas. Uh, next slide. And one of the things I, I will say about, um, or at least with this slide right here, just to share with everyone, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I will tell you that this is um, uh, sort of the uh, captures our annual report for, and it shows really the journey of OC waste and recycling and, and what we've been going through to get to this point where we have composting and uh, uh, co-located at the landfills and um, sort of what we've done uh, in order to change the mindset in our culture. And one of the things that uh, was mentioned earlier about having uh, residents uh, living near the, our landfills, I would say uh, we have a master plan in place for the county where these landfills at one time were very remote uh, and there was no residents around them. And today we have neighbors. And we're very um, cognizant of our neighbors and, and we manage uh, our landfill system to try and mitigate as much as we possibly can any operational impacts associated with the operations of receiving waste and processing it. And so, and as such, um, and now that we're composting, we're, we're, we're doing the same thing. So go ahead, next slide. So what is it that we're doing? It's really, we've established this culture of the Kaizen mindset, uh, really talking about continuous improvement of, of how we not only manage the landfills, but expanding towards resource recovery. And so we now have um, implemented a, a plan to integrate composting, but are working towards um, uh, basically putting in infrastructure where we could do uh, work with our local wastewater treatment uh, facilities for co-digestion and uh, establishing a path forward to um, justify having anaerobic digestion uh, facilities built and co-located at the landfills. We're also taking a look at uh, uh, tapping into uh, the properties we have to incorporate uh, solar and providing renewable energy. Since we're already um, providing renewable energy with the use of landfill gas energy, we're looking at ways we can further enhance uh, our service providing uh, within the county. We're also taking a look at um, uh, sort of what we can do to further, I'll say, the industry as far as having domestic, and as much as we possibly can, I'll say, domestic recycling infrastructure. I see historically, um, recycling infrastructure has been outside of uh, the state. And uh, and so what we're looking at right now is as an agency, what can we do to also foster and help uh, create uh, domestic recycling infrastructure by uh, I'll say participating with um, local uh, groups and nonprofits associated with uh, sustainability. And part of what we're doing, we have um, these agreements with our jurisdictions that are waste disposal agreements. And what we're now changing towards what we call WISE agreements, which is Waste Infrastructure System Enhancement Agreements, where um, what we're not just providing a service to receive the waste and bury it, but really it's a service uh, to uh, put in infrastructure for uh, composting um, creating markets related to uh, where is the compost going to go after you create it um, and supporting the compliance under SB 1383, whereas jurisdictions are required to take back uh, the compost within their communities and put it to use uh, and creating, um, and as you can imagine, with 34 different cities, there are various uh, programs in place 
one of the goals is to uh, we talk about education and outreach. One of the goals is to create a standard that is regional for these programs to create consistency amongst the various jurisdictions and uh, and their service providing. Um, and this is a, a greater uh, push towards regional collaboration as we work towards uh, changing not only our business model, but changing the mindset and the way we look at waste uh, within the county and putting in infrastructure to support uh, the diversion of that material away from the landfills. Because as uh, I'll, I'll just, I think pretty much everyone that can hear my voice on this call uh, knows that uh, the landfill business model is really a going out of business model because eventually you go from being an asset, right? You can uh, easily dispose of something till you're, uh, you fill up and you close and then you become a liability and you have to manage that into perpetuity. So, um, you know, a lot of that, what we're trying to do is educate people on the impacts of their behaviors and what they're doing in, in order to not only extend the life of uh, the landfills that we have currently existing uh, and, and active, uh, but also uh, utilize that to help change people's behavior so they're putting the right thing in the right container so it can make it uh, to the right location to either be recycled or composted. Next slide, please. So this is uh, our infographic uh, to sort of tell the story of what we're doing. It's uh, And we're right now in phase one of that infographic. We have uh, of, our, of our plan uh, where we currently have three compost facilities that are built and under operations. Uh, very excited about that. Uh, I'll, I'll say we it was a heavy investment in our own workforce development because SB 1383 created the need for industry experts, not only the, the need for infrastructure, but uh, those individuals to operate the, uh, the equipment and the facilities to um, uh, divert the material from the landfills. So we invested in our employees and trained them to provide them a new skill set to uh, compost at our um, at our facilities. And so our phase two, uh, again, identified for co-digestion and, and that we're working towards right now and having discussions with our uh, wastewater treatment uh, uh, agencies. And ultimately, co-digestion is where you take the source-separated uh, organics or food waste uh, that would could be composted on a on a commercial scale, where we could take it, homogenize it, clean it up, and provide it for co digestion for biogas production at the wastewater treatment facilities. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, our compost facilities do accept uh, food scraps, uh, manure, uh, as well as residential green waste. Uh, and and really, that's our focus is the residential green waste, uh, because prior to um, uh, us having compost facilities in place, the residential green waste in Orange County was actually coming into the landfills as alternative daily cover. And uh, that had been going on since 1996. And uh, there was a change in legislation, which was AB 1594, that um, said it was no longer uh, allowed or even considered diversion. And we had been in that went into place in 2020. And so uh, since 2017, we had been working towards uh, establishing uh, not only compost facilities and the permits associated with them, but also building uh, the workforce uh, to manage and run those compost facilities. So go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so here's a beautiful picture of our compost facilities. Um, and so this is a sort of the results of our, I'll say phase 1A, we are, we have a, a phase 1B where we're going to go to covered aerated static piles uh, to help uh, increase our throughput and manage mother nature. Uh, just to let you know, we worked closely with the U.S. Compost Council in order to get not only get the uh, training and certification uh, and help build the skill set of our employees, but we're also, our facilities are STA certified. Uh, we produce STA certified uh, compost, which is seal of testing assurance through the U.S. Compost Council. We're very excited about that. Um, and if you live in Orange County and you hear my voice, um, just letting you know right now, you can have some for free. 
Um, and so uh, with that, um, our long-term goal eventually is to get to the level where we're composting anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 tons of uh, material a day. So next slide. So we talk about um, our landfill system and greenhouse gas reduction. So we have a, a smart landfill program that we are, um, we're working on and putting in place uh, and where we're looking at three of our active landfills right now. Uh, again, we are one's in uh, San Juan Capistrano, one's in the city of Irvine, one's in the city of Brea, and collectively, in a, uh, and over the year, we receive about 5 million tons uh, annually. And so what we're working on is upgrading our landfills to a smart landfill program. We also have two uh, very active closed landfill sites uh, that we're going to be part of the smart landfill program, where we're looking to use best available technology uh, to manage the landfill gas collection in real time. Uh, as you heard on the previous um, uh, from the previous presenter, that uh, they already have a system in place. We're looking at implementing that across all three of our active landfills, two of our um, uh, closed landfill sites, in order to really manage uh, the collection of the landfill gas, but also at the same time, we are looking at the operational standards associated with uh, the diff management of the, um, I'll say, fugitive emissions associated with differential settlement uh, and, and um, changing the operations model, the use of uh, drones for inspection on a more frequent basis and with methane detect uh, detecting technology and uh, in order to um, identify uh, um, sort of emissions, being able to address them sooner, but also with the collection system, the focus is on uh, being able to fine tune the wellheads and manage the um, collection of that landfill gas in real time. I mean, what how it happens today, it's, a, it's an antiquated process where you have to go out with the gym, uh, uh, take your readings, uh, gather the information, it goes into a spreadsheet, goes into a system, and then you have to uh, uh, tune it manually. So what we want to do is be able to uh, tune it remotely and be able to monitor it remotely and have real-time data um, at our fingertips. And so the goal is to be able to respond faster, quicker, and, um, and this is ultimately our goal for the county. Next slide, please. So we, what we did, uh, in, in order to do that, it costs money. So in order to do this, uh, we did submit, we're part of an MSA uh, and supply, uh, applied a, um, uh, under our CPRG uh, grant funding for the Smart Landfill Program. Um, we, it'll cost a little bit less than 25 million. And we anticipate um, a conservative estimates that we would, it would have a 13% um, overall impact for uh, landfill gas recovery, in, or at least increase it. And one of the um, uh, goals, again, for us is to put this in place to have it long term. So with that, next slide, please. And uh, again, this is really a change in mindset and behavior and what we're doing uh, as an agency. And I will say this, uh, that if you're in Orange County vacationing, look us up, come down for a tour. We would love uh, uh, to have a social hour with you and show you what we're doing. With that, I'll just thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Great to hear um, all the things happening in Orange County. Um, and we can go to the next slide, please. And so now we will be discussing some of the exciting funding opportunities and technical resources that can support local governments looking to implement similar programs. Um, and next slide, please. We are lucky to be joined by Claudia Fabiano and Clara Zimmerman with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Claudia is on the Sustainable Management of Food Team within the Office of Resource Conservation and Recovery, and Clara is a program manager with the Landfill Methane Outreach Program and the Global Methane Initiative. And I will hand it to you both. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, if you could go to the next slide, that'd be great. 
I'm really happy to be here presenting with uh, Clara today. And I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes talking about some of EPA's work in the wasted food space. Uh, can you go on to the next slide? So this is our wasted food scale. Tom uh, showed this earlier in the presentation and hopefully most of you have seen this by now, but this came out about six months ago and was based on um, a few years of research uh, that EPA conducted on the environmental impact of wasted food. So this replaces our old food recovery hierarchy and it ranks wasted food pathways from the most to the least environmentally preferable, again, based on a life cycle assessment and circularity assessment in our 2023 report called from field to bin, the environmental impacts of US food waste management pathways. It is available in eight languages in both simple and detailed versions. So we encourage all of you to check out our website and download it and feel free to use it. Um, it is based again, specifically on the environmental performance of wasted food in the pathways. So it doesn't apply to other kinds of waste and it does not take into account social and economic factors. Um, as you can see here, some of the tiers have more than one pathway in them. And I just wanna clarify that that means um, that we determined them to have equivalent performance. So I just wanted to briefly touch on a few broad findings and Tom introduced this earlier, so I will go quickly. But um, first, not surprisingly, but source reduction, donation and upcycling are the most environmentally preferable pathways. That was the case in our old food recovery hierarchy as well. And that's because they can displace additional food produ production. Um, however, the benefits of pathways beyond source reduction and donation and upcycling are small relative to the environmental impacts of food production, so they can do little to offset those, those impacts of production. Um, I want to point out that sewer and wastewater treatment, um, which we shorthanded here to sending food waste down the drain, and landfilling stand out for their sizable methane emissions. Sending food waste down the drain was not something we had previously looked at, so it was not in our old food recovery hierarchy. So just wanted to note that that's something new here. And those two pathways along with incineration are to be avoided if at all possible. Um, in terms of recycling wasted food into soil amendments, we have composting and anaerobic digestion uh, reflected in this scale. And uh, those pathways offer opportunities to make long-term improvements in soil structure and health and help regenerate ecosystems by recovering that nitrogen and carbon and returning them to the soil. So there's two things I wanted to note that are new about this guidance and this scale. Um, the anaerobic digestion ranking, you'll see it twice on the scale, and that's because it's dependent on whether digestate and biosolids are used beneficially or if they're disposed. And then second, I wanted to note that composting is now ranked equally to anaerobic digestion, where the AD process uses those that digestate or biosolids beneficially. So those are just some things to highlight that are new. Um, and then I also just want to note that as the U.S. becomes less dependent on fossil fuels for energy, the environmental value of producing energy from wasted food through things like AD, incineration, and landfill gas capture will decrease. Um, so that was a whirlwind. I could talk about this forever, but I did just want to highlight this and point out that it is new and um, it is available for all of you to use. And there's much more information on the analysis that went into this um, in, in our reports on our website. Can you go on to the next slide? Um, so I only have a minute, but I just wanted to mention a few of our resources available to you. This is not an exhaustive list, but um, a few things that might be helpful to, to folks involved in this space. So in 2023, we launched a searchable database of local and state government climate action plans that include measures to address materials management and waste. So you can search those by state or by topic to find what you're looking for and see how other entities have, have tackled those issues. We also have our excess food opportunities map. This is a nationwide tool that depicts potential generators and recipients of excess food. We've also included um, food access and assistance data from USDA, as well as environmental justice data from EPA's EJ screen tool. Um, we also have recently published in 2023, two social marketing toolkits. These are um, aimed at helping communities who are either trying to engage their residents in preventing wasted food at home or trying to um, address uh, or expand um, curbside composting programs or address contamination in an existing program. Um, they walk through how to conduct a social marketing um, campaign and they also include um, downloadable and customizable campaign assets that were contributed by um, communities as well as uh, NRDC. Um, I'll also mention that we have the waste reduction model, which we call WARM, and this provides high level comparisons of potential greenhouse gas emissions, reductions, energy savings, and economic impacts when looking at different um, types of materials management pra uh, practices. 
that does include 60 materials, including food and other types of organics like yard waste. And finally, we have a model recycling program toolkit, which is searchable and contains dozens of resources on a lot of different topics. Um, and that also contains our managing and transforming waste streams tool there. So there's more things I'd love to tell you about, but this is just a smattering and I would encourage you to check out our website uh, for more. I have one last slide for me before turning it over to Clara. So can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So what's next from EPA? Um, a few months ago, EPA, USDA, and FDA jointly released a draft national strategy for reducing food loss and waste and recycling organics. And this basically lays out actions that each of the three agencies plan to take to address all the problems and all the issues that we're talking about today and to help us reach our um, food waste reduction goals and our recycling goals. Um, the comment period closed in February. We are going over and looking at about 10,000 comments um, and plan to finalize the strategy in the coming months. So I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Clara Zimmerman, the co-lead for EPA's Landfill Methane Outreach Program. Thanks so much, Claudia. And I, I will be very brief because I know we want to get to questions. Um, the Landfill Methane Outreach Program is an EPA voluntary partnership program we've been promoting landfill gas energy recovery for nearly 30 years, and that we do that through partnerships, technical assistance, and information sharing um, with, you know, all of our partners, including landfill operators, communities, states, and local governments, and the landfill gas industry. Next slide. And um, I'll just briefly share some highlights. We have a lot of great tools and resources uh, for free to download on our website, um, including an Excel tool to help you estimate the costs of installing a gas collection and control system that's called LFG Cost Web, and also resources related to renewable natural gas project development, some of the technologies that were mentioned today by the governments. And then next slide. And we did want to make sure we touched on um, funding opportunities. So the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act allocated money for grants and other funding mechanisms for a variety of project initiatives that include clean energy and methane reduction strategies. Some of these are tax credits that are still being worked out by the IRS. Um, and then I'll turn over to Claudia back to talk about a few of these. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight a few of the grant programs. Um, so two new grant programs were developed under, well, several, but two for our program specifically under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And uh, one of those is the Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling Grants Program, and then the Recycling Education and Outreach Grants. Um, neither of those opportunities are currently open because we just finished um, our selection cycle, our first selection cycle. But of the almost 200 million that EPA announced this fall through those two programs, about 83 million of that is going to support about 70 projects that will include activities related to organics, recycling, composting, or anaerobic digestion. And most of that is going to composting projects most of which included food waste. So those awards went to communities, states, territories, and tribes. Um, the slide also lists some of the new programs under the Inflation Reduction Act, such as the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants Program, which we also heard about from other presenters and others that may relate to landfill gas energy. Um, I also wanna to touch on USDA. They have a lot of different funding opportunities. The Composting and Food Waste Reduction Grant Program awards about 11 million per year to local and municipal governments. Um, that should be opening up soon, uh, ho hopefully later this month. So keep an eye out for that opportunity. And another open opportunity that just, uh, that just opened is the USDA Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. And they currently have a funding opportunity open for food loss and waste training and technical assistance and we'll award up to $8 million. And those proposals are due at the end of June. Um, USDA also has the REAP, the Rural Energy for America program, um, which was an existing program, but received new funding under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, Clara? Yes, and I'll just highlight two more. So EPA community change grants are open until November of this year, and waste management is one of the focus areas. And then the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program, EECBG, is open just until the end of this month, um, and it has a landfill methane capture focus area. Um, next, I think we can wrap up there, and uh, feel free to email us. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia and Clara. Great to hear about the tools and resources out there to support other local governments. And I think I'll bring back Tom Frankowitz and the rest of the panelists for some rapid fire Q&A. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Sally. 
And uh, we got a lot of great questions in the, the Q&A part. Uh, we're not gonna be able to get to most of them, but we will follow up with written responses uh, to all the participants along with the recording. So I, I'll just do a, a, a question to all the panelists, uh, you know, maybe in a minute or less, if each of you could answer, you know, what is one action you would hope participants could walk away with that they could take back to their community to implement to reduce methane emissions from the waste sector? I'll, I'll go first. Um, so I, I mean, I think the easiest thing is it's even if it's as simple as educating the residents of that community to change some of their behaviors. You do not need infrastructure to make a significant change. You do not need to build something or have special collection or drop off points. Basic education around reducing the amount of food you're purchasing, reusing uh, your um, leftovers, uh, buying less, that little bit of education can make a significant impact in reducing that organic waste going to the landfill. Um, and that is often free. If you get your elected leaders, your community leaders, your business leaders to start talking about that, it can make a big difference. I, I just want to piggy off, piggyback off what Arya said as far as the education. And I, um, and that's one of the reasons why we offer up tours is seeing is a believing and getting people out to see, um, uh, I'll say, if you can get people out to provide tours of uh, landfills and facilities so they can see the impacts of what happens when people make the wrong decision, um, I, I think it, it helps change that behavior. Um, because quite frankly, nobody really cares about what happens unless uh, to waste unless they smell it or it doesn't get picked up. So, uh, you know, all of you here, um, I'll say you're kindred spirits, and uh, I, I think we're preaching to the, the choir about it, but um, I, I think there's a greater opportunity to change behavior when you can show the impacts of uh, what happens when people are making uh, their decision to place something in the right container. Great. Thanks, Tom. I'm happy to add to that. I mean, I love what Ari and Tom said about waste prevention. Um, I will always sing that tune. And I think when we talk about just taking it up to a, a higher level is just keeping food out of landfills. I mean, EPA's new data shows 58% of methane emissions coming from landfills are due to food waste. And when we talk about keeping food out of landfills, we're not just talking about composting it. That's a great solution, but really preventing it from getting anywhere close to that is, is your first uh your first solution and it, it doesn't involve building a whole lot of infrastructure. So I totally agree with those sentiments. On the lines of education, I think educating yourself as to what systems and infrastructures and processes already exist in your local jurisdiction. I know oftentimes the thoughts and ideas and entrepreneurial spirit is to create a new solution, but that solution may already exist and could use a little extra love and support and voice. So uh, take a step to pause, reflect what exists how do you elevate and highlight that? And how do you fit in the gaps as needed moving forward? We've got a couple more minutes. I think we've got two minutes left. Roxanne, Clara, if you want to jump in. I think Claudia covered it from EPA's perspective. Thanks. Yeah, same for me, Tom, you're right. Go see the landfill. We do a lot of tours and it's um, it's a it's a good experience for everybody, uh, including the staff at our facility to be able to show off what they do and be proud of what they do. So come see the landfill. I think that is a great closing line. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of people getting out there. Uh, we'll wrap up there. And uh, we've got our QR code uh, for folks to find the events page in the future. Um, Ellie, any um, uh, closing wrap up? Yeah, just th thanks to all our presenters and thanks to everyone in the audience for joining today. Um, really exciting to have everyone come together. And I know there's a bunch of questions we did not get to, but we will um, answer those in, in written follow-up along with the recording um, and other resources. Um, so thank you so much. And yeah, please stay in touch if you have other questions or want to share additional success stories um, with us over email. We're always eager for that. So um, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.